All right. Well, now is as good a time as any to get started. Thank you for joining today's webinar on Capital Campaigns 101. I uh, appreciate uh, those that have joined and we are recording this session uh, to post up on YouTube to provide um, an opportunity for others in the future to um, access uh, this content and, and hopefully um, find themselves uh, with better resources than maybe are currently available to understand uh, campaign work. Um, I uh, certainly enjoy uh, taking individuals through this Capital Campaigns 101 training. Um, it's really meant to be a primer for volunteers and staff, um, a fundamental understanding of some of, the, some of the key ingredients that go into campaigns. Um, I don't anticipate that I'll miss anything too significant from an introductory standpoint, but of course, there are so many interesting um, concepts to explore uh, as it relates to campaigns. And if there is anything after the presentation that you would um, like to explore with me personally, don't hesitate to reach out. Also, we'll save some time at the end, maybe for some questions. Um, but if there um, are also questions that come up and you want to put them in the chat function, I'll either try to answer them during the course of the webinar or um, I'll reach out personally um, afterward and uh, connect with you separately. So uh, with that, let's uh, do a little bit uh, of an introduction. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm the author now uh, of a few fundraising books. I spent the better part of a few months last year completing books that I'd been working on for the better part of a dozen years. And uh, finally, after... Um, semi-retiring from my uh, consulting firm that I was with for nearly 25 years, I had a little bit of time to take on some of those uh, projects that were um, impossible to get to, but important to me, passion projects, if you will. Um, I come from a family of fundraisers, uh, so even though I had no intent at a College to get into professional fundraising, uh, it found me very easily, and um, and I have just been enamored with the profession ever since. And um, even though I spent 25 years in fundraising consulting, I knew I wanted to spend more time than that, and that gave birth to uh, a company that I recently started called the Five Tool Fundraiser, which is really all about. Uh, equipping fundraisers to um, become the best possible uh, professional development uh, fundraisers they, they can. And uh, on the website, you'll find a lot of content that is helpful to fundraisers, including webinars, including white papers, including um, a variety of um, resources and tools that uh, any fundraiser would find helpful no matter where um, they are in their journey. So uh, do check it out if you, you can. So uh, Capital Campaigns, let's get started. And I think with anything, there is uh, a need to provide a bit of a definition. And to begin, uh, I wanted to distinguish between an annual campaign and, and a capital campaign your annual campaign or annual fundraising might or might not be included in your capital campaign, depending on its structure. And by capital, I'm not referring to facilities. Capital does not necessarily refer to a campaign that is focused on raising money for a building. The term capital campaign refers to money. The word capital campaign speaks broadly to an effort that is traditionally over and above what needs to be raised on an annual basis and is most often focused on resources for buildings, for endowment, for programs, debt relief, or any number of particular needs of an organization. As you can see on the screen, the common definition of a campaign is an intensive fundraising effort designed to raise a specific amount of money within a defined period of time, uh, thus with a particular start and end date to meet some specific need or set of needs. 
The classic example is the $10 million capital campaign that takes two years to complete, focuses on raising funds for a new building for uh, the organization. But the classic example is uh, quickly being replaced by a more holistic approach to campaigns, uh, which is really what people call a comprehensive campaign. Uh, the big notable organizations like public and private universities, larger hospitals, they've been doing cap comprehensive campaigns for quite some time now. Um, and this strategy is really beginning to take hold with smaller organizations as well. Uh, essentially, a comprehensive campaign is a method of fundraising where all dollars that come into um, an organization philanthropically over a set period of time are counted in campaign totals. So an organization that, let's say, raises a million dollars a year philanthropically with some growth over time might try to raise $6 million over five years, which would essentially be a $1.2 million average over five years. And then next, let's say you need another $6 million for a building the organization wants to build or purchase. And then another $2 million for the endowment the organization intends to build. When you add all of that up, your comprehensive campaign total or goal is $14 million. Um, and that's how you ultimately come to um, that comprehensive total. But, you know, the classic campaign is still very common and um, often excludes annual fundraising and is very specific to um, one or more needs that are counted separately. Um, importantly, there are um, more goals and objectives with campaigns beyond just the um, reaching of a particular financial goal. Um, when I talk about other objectives, I might include, for example, the opportunity to advance the institution's mission through the achievement of your campaign objectives. So um, not a hyper focus on the number, the goal, the, the money, but what does it allow the organization to do in terms of uh, its mission and, and how far does it move the needle forward in that endeavor? We also see campaigns as an opportunity to involve new volunteers into the organization. And sometimes those volunteers are being groomed for board roles, um, which is great. So campaigns are often a wonderful proving ground for new volunteers and a way for others to get more involved and even get existing board members more involved. Um, we want to raise the level of awareness for the organization and the community, and usually by virtue of the accelerated enhanced communication efforts of campaigns, there's um, all kinds of different opportunities to make the organization a stronger, more visible one in the community. Um, it's important whether the campaign is a standalone uh, campaign or comprehensive to maintain and strengthen the level of annual support. Uh, a question we often get very frequently um, in campaign work is whether it's true that when you're raising money for a campaign, your annual fundraising suffers. And while there is a very strong opportunity for annual fundraising to be negatively impacted by a poorly conceived, poorly constructed, poorly communicated, poorly implemented campaign, if you're thoughtful about the approach with donors, if you're thoughtful about the sequencing of activities and the development and design of your campaign plan, there is absolutely no reason why your annual fundraising can't continue to grow, even in the face of some of these extraordinary requests that you'll be making for the special needs in the campaign. Specifically, and often this comes from the fact that we are very intentionally and carefully creating a multi-pronged request to some of the organization's strongest annual supporters, um, where they're being asked to maintain or grow their annual support as the first priority, and then giving careful consideration to an over and above gift to support campaign priorities on top. Um, that's how you often um, prevent the campaign from cannibalizing annual fund support. 
Um, and it can happen if you're not careful and not intentional, if you don't provide the appropriate training to staff and volunteers about um, how to avoid it. Uh, further, campaigns can enhance the philanthropic culture of an institution by prioritizing giving and placing so much attention on it. Uh, if I were to line up 10 development officers or 10 nonprofit CEOs and ask them what campaigns have done to their organizations over a 20 year period of time, uh, where maybe those organizations have run two or three campaigns consistently in that time period, they would say that the campaigns were the transformational periods of time where their organizations grew to the next level of sophistication and philanthropic achievement. So there's lots of benefits of running uh, a great campaign. Uh, I wanted to next turn our attention to some of the elements that are vital for success. Um, and we'll cover these uh, as we go through the presentation. We could not cover Campaigns 101 without diving more deeply into these things. Um, but they're all important. And it's not as if you can just eliminate one of these things and uh, be assured of success. Um, often we talk about fundraising and campaign fundraising as a team sport. There's multiple factors that go into the magic of a successful campaign. And there's multiple people responsible for the success of a campaign, each playing their unique roles. Um, but when you look, uh, sort of peel back uh, the onion on successful campaigns, you most consistently find that there are these elements all working together. And that doesn't mean that you have all of these elements uh, built on day one. You don't wait for all of these things to exist before starting a campaign. A lot of these things are developed over the course of a campaign. Um, so I, I don't want everyone to just uh, sort of uh, think that you can um, build, 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 build uh, into all of these strong, strong elements and then be ready to go. You can't. Um, you just need to sort of pull the trigger and recognize what needs to be strengthened um, and uh, where you already have strengths and just continually find solutions to some of these areas where you might not have um, a sufficient capacity. Um, and often, you know, we find that uh, there are solutions um, once you've identified them. And so you want to keep working on those solutions throughout the campaign. Um, Along with the key elements of success and things that we'll sort of uh, jump into during the course of this webinar, there are real building blocks, uh, a step-by-step -step approach even to creating a successful campaign. Like, for example, the building block of free campaign planning, which we'll talk about in, in just a minute. So um, let's sit back and kind of take each of these building blocks uh, one by one and, and have a, a bit of a dialogue about those or discussion about those because each of them is so incredibly important to your success. Um, so where I start um, is with pre-campaign planning, as I mentioned, and often you might have heard of the concept of a uh, feasibility study or a feasibility and planning study or a uh, pre-campaign planning study, some sort of study that um, precedes a campaign, which then allows you ideally to move forward confidently with a campaign in the future. And um, the interesting thing about pre-campaign planning and studies for that matter is that they are intended to be part of the campaign. They are a very foundational phase of a campaign. So uh, depending on the size and scope of the campaign, um, that'll often drive what pre-campaign planning will, will look like. Um, and so the question often comes up, uh, is my organization looking who's looking at a campaign um, required to do a feasibility and planning study 
in advance of embarking on a campaign uh, for success. And I recognize that for some institutions where there's a pattern uh, and history of conducting campaigns, the value of a traditional feasibility and planning study is perhaps not as significant as it might be for an organization that has never done a campaign or has some real consensus building uh, to do around a campaign or really questions the capacity that they have uh, to meet a goal or capacity of staff or volunteers to be successful or a thousand other questions that might uh, come to mind, like, um, you know, is our database sufficient with volunteers to be successful or how many new donors do we need to create uh, for this campaign to be successful? Um, is there enthusiasm for our plans um, among our donor base? Um, uh, how are we messaging this effort so that it seems urgent and compelling and exciting to prospective donors? Um, these are all you know, really important questions that need answers. And typically you want to drive toward those answers before you come out of the gate with your fundraising and your campaign um, effort. So whether the organization is embarking on a traditional and formal study process um, or not, there is value in planning. There's value in identifying the questions that are concerning, that are keeping people from moving themselves forward and being confident in the uh, opportunity for success. And so uh, some process that allows you to answer those questions and develop a plan for the campaign is critically important. And some um, staff and volunteers and uh, leadership of an organization are capable of conducting this pre-campaign planning uh, independently, which is amazing and awesome. And other organizations really benefit from having a professional to guide them through this, this process. Um, and you'll have to figure out uh, which type of organization you are, one that uh, can accomplish all, all of the question answering and um, plan development process yourself, or if you need someone to help you through that process. Uh, and there's no shame uh, in, in, cert in certainly reaching out uh, to other professionals and other experts uh, to provide that guidance. Uh, in fact, it's just very common for organizations who have never run a campaign to um, partner up with a professional. So uh, don't feel like you're doing anything strange or unusual by, uh, by reaching out and finding a professional to help you through that process. And so um, when I think about pre-campaign planning, they're just, you know, I want to drive into the issue of questions more fully. Um, because it's the questions that people ask that uh, provide evidence of their objections, of their concerns, um, of the barriers that they're going to have to jumping in more fully. And there's obviously the question of readiness. How prepared is the staff, the development staff, particularly other institutional le leadership to give time and attention to the campaign? Is the board prepared to support this effort financially? Uh, and, and at a substantial level that's usually required to succeed. Um, will the board lead or will they be dragged into this? Um, and obviously having um, a board that is sort of pushing things forward rather than being pulled into it is important and uh, ideal. Um, you need to really understand the merits of your projects, uh, the, the fundraising elements of your case for support and how strong those are from a philanthropic standpoint, um, answering questions like, is the entire project requiring philanthropic support or is there some percentage of the effort that is philanthropic, some part that's public perhaps uh, supported, so it's a public-private partnership, um, what, what, what does the uh, what does the mechanics of of that project look like so that people can really understand exactly what it is that you're going to do and how much you need? 
Um, and I often find that people will dissolve in logic. So when you provide them answers that make sense, uh, they'll more likely um, be supportive. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about some of these objectives, there are uh, often endowment uh, elements included in campaigns. And, you know, the way that you talk about endowment is substantially different than the way you talk about capital projects and building projects and substantially different than the way you talk about program support or annual support. Um, so you have to figure out the proper messaging for all of those things, um, understanding the right collateral materials that need to be developed. You need to spend time understanding how you're going to implement the campaign. Where do you start? How long is it going to take? What's the budget that's required for this? Um, what are your incremental goals? What type of activity levels need to be provided? You know, how many asks are you going to uh, need and at what levels to be successful? So question after question after question, get them all on paper and really strategically try to answer those questions so that um, everyone has the opportunity to um, understand what um, what the rationale is behind all of this, and they can dissolve in logic and move forward um, uh, as one. So after campaign planning, um, or not even after, I, like I should say, as part of the campaign planning process, one of the objectives that you have is to set an appropriate financial goal for the campaign. And setting a goal is not entirely scientific. It's a little more scientific than it has been uh, in the decades preceding, but it's still um, part art and part science. Um, and it's a real concern and challenge when you think about the fact that you can't set a goal that's too high because that can be potentially very damaging. It really makes people feel um, uh, uncomfortable and like they've been a failure and um, that they uh, have let people down when a goal is too high and hasn't been met. And at the same time, you don't want a goal to be too low uh, because then you haven't really stretched the imagination of prospective donors. You have not really um, allowed yourself perhaps to think more strategically about how you can turn um, a large investment into mission advancement. Um, setting the goal um, at the right amount means that you've set a goal at a level that is not seen as uh, too high, that is seen as achievable, but yet at the same time challenging, which will raise sights among your donors and prospective donors, allow you to accomplish great things, um, and will allow you to exceed that goal by some level. Uh, so what we, we want to avoid is, you know, you setting a $10 million goal and raising five or even eight or nine. You want to raise $10.5 million on your $10 million goal. Or maybe even uh, better yet, you set an immediate objective of $10 million. You get to 10 and then you say to yourself, you know, we've got more to do. We've got more space, more timeline more runway, we can raise more money. So we're going to set a challenge objective of $12 million, $2 million above our immediate objective. And we're gonna go after that. So not only are you looking uh, at exceeding your uh, goal, but you're now able to raise the bar a little bit more. And ultimately, if you set that $12 million objective and you do not hit that, uh, you would normally revert back to talking points around that $10 million and say, hey, we um, set an initial objective, a campaign goal of $10 million. We hit that. We looked at raising more and we were successful in raising $11.25 million. And as a result of that extraordinary success, we were allowed to, we were enable to do X, Y, and Z. So um, all of these 
factors are um, psychologically important about setting the right goal at the right amount, not something too high, uh, not something too low that people would say is a slam dunk, which um, we don't uh, ever want people to, to actually say. Um, and there are a variety of inputs to determining that number. If you've run previous campaigns, you um, have a really good sense often of what your capacity is. Um, you need to look at what levels of major gift or anchor gift type support you're going to get because in capital campaigns, often um, the larger gifts are the most important gifts. They raise usually two thirds or more uh, of the campaign goals. So um, having assurances going in that you have sufficient prospects and maybe even uh, some identified donors uh, at that uh, at those significant levels is really important. Uh, you want to make sure that you have uh, a sufficient number of prospects at all of the different levels. That's part of the study process. If you have a table of gifts that says you need uh, 200 prospective donors at a variety of levels, do you have those prospective donors identified? Or um, are you short substantially uh, in terms of overall prospects and at some of those higher levels? Those kinds of inputs would cause um, many organizations to reconsider their, their goals. So you need to look at the analytics of your database, the gift indications from a, a feasibility and planning study where people are asked to provide input on the size of their potential gift. Um, you need to really understand where some of those bigger gifts are likely to, to come. And it often helps too to understand the uh, capabilities of the leadership that you've recruited to join because I've um, found over many decades of work that great leaders, meaning um, really talented fundraising CEOs, really capable CDOs, uh, really extraordinary board chairs, and really uh, committed and generous campaign chairs will um, almost make any goal possible. Uh, but when you lack strength of fundraising leadership in those key positions, it would cause uh, any normal organization to think carefully about putting a goal out that's too high. And, you know, you can really effectively evaluate yourself across a lot of different categories, like previous fundraising success in major gifts, um, board giving potential, leadership strength in fundraising, the database strength, and so many um, additional uh, elements as well. So um, really spend time thinking about um, where you are as an organization and the strengths that you have and the challenges you have. And always remember too, um, it's much easier to raise a goal uh, and that always feels good. It, and conversely, it never feels good to have to lower a goal um, or miss a goal. And that uh, just leaves people feeling um, like they've failed in some way. And we, we want campaigns, especially the first campaigns that organizations do, to be extraordinarily successful. It's critically important that a first campaign be successful because if you run a successful campaign for the first time, you're more likely to run campaigns again in the future. And that will be a direct positive impact impact on the, the future uh, revenue of the organization. Conversely, if you fail the first time you run a campaign, you'll, you feel sort of um, snake bitten and unwilling to venture out again um, for any campaign because the previous one was a failure. And that can really hinder your revenue potential in the future significantly. So make those first campaigns um, predictably successful by 
establishing a very reasonable goal and something that while still challenging, you know, you can, you can hit. So let's turn our attention to the case for support. And uh, the case really is the official story of the campaign. It tells um, the reader about who you are as an organization, your history, the, the challenges presented to you, the opportunities that you have to make an extraordinary impact, and really what you need to do through this campaign to achieve uh, your vision, your mission, and, um, and how this campaign is essential for the organization to thrive and for you to be able to um, impact many, many more um, individuals with your work. And it's great when you can weave a strategic plan into that conversation uh, because that strategic plan usually ha offers a great uh, vision into the future of the organization and can um, really talk uh, about the importance of steps like campaigns in, in meeting those particular goals. Um, the, the case for support, uh, I want to distinguish between the campaign brochure um, by saying that the case for support is often just a narrative document. It's um, so often a word document that uh, is meant to be uh, a resource and a tool for the organization and the campaign, um, meaning that if you've created a strong narrative then you can use it as a tool, a resource to create all of your future collateral, your proposals, your brochures, your um, um, even invitations, your video scripting, no matter what it is. So you really want to create a case for support that offers the very strongest messaging and appeal to prospective donors. And let's remember the audience for this case for support for a campaign are donors, are prospective donors. Um, it's not necessarily the larger community, um, though, though you hope it appeals to them, obviously, but more specifically, you're trying to speak to the donor that has the potential to support you financially through this campaign. Um, and it's critically important that it doesn't have a lot of holes in it. And by holes, I mean um, it doesn't sort of create more questions in the mind of a prospective donor or a reader, that it answers those questions, that when you say you need uh, $100 million to complete this project and you're raising $20 million, you don't leave it at that because the question I would ask is, well, where the heck is that other $80 million coming from? Yeah, you, ha you have to answer the questions well and strategically so that the reader says, I get it. Ah, this makes sense. Um, and, you know, I think there's often a concern with case for some more documents being too long. I, I wouldn't worry about it being too long. I'd worry more about it being too incomplete. Um, and perhaps if it's too long, then maybe you've said the same thing more than once. I would avoid redundancy, but it's important that you answer all of the key questions uh, that you've addressed. Some of the things that I've mentioned here on the screen, like having a call to action, what's the real impact um, where are you going to spend the money? Why is your organization the best one to, to do this work? Um, why does it matter to the prospective donor? Some of those kinds of things are tremendously important. And that case for support um, becomes essential, as I mentioned, anytime you're trying to create uh, content. And, because essentially, you know, we want every single person within the organization to be speaking from this document. Uh, you want to be you know, singing from the same hymnal. So everyone's got the same messaging, the same language. They understand the situation in the same way, and they are speaking from um, the same source. So the case for support in that way is incredibly important. And 
when it's created urgently, it's creating in a compelling way, um, it just motivates donors to action. And, uh, and, and you can figure out, for example, the ways to really uh, pull at the heartstrings uh, through your brochure video content uh, in the stories that you tell and the way that you tell them, okay? Um, every campaign requires prospective donors to succeed can't raise money without donors. And it's important to um, talk a little bit about how those prospects are identified and, and how those uh, prospective donors um, are uh, targeted through your campaign. Um, you know, I want to make sure that everyone understands that most campaigns succeed because they engage their existing donors to give to the annual support efforts, but then get them also to give over and above. Uh, you can't necessarily go into a campaign and say, well, this campaign isn't going to touch our existing donors. We want to raise all of this money from exclusively new donors so that we don't put pressure on our existing donors. That's not the way it works. Um, it would actually backfire if you were to um, prevent your existing stakeholders, your existing family members, your existing friends, your existing donors. <laughs> They're all the same thing. Um, prevent them from participating in something that is possibly the most exciting endeavor your organization has. You owe it to them to invite them to consider an investment. So go to, first and foremost, your existing donors, and especially those with great capacity. Okay? And they're, I'm talking about board members. I'm talking about existing major donors, some of your longstanding supporters, those that have been giving to you consistently for 5, 10, 15 20 years or more, um, you have to go back to those folks. They are going to be often the best and first place to go to. Um, but we have to admit the campaigns are a significant point of entry for many new donors. The excitement that campaigns create um, generally uh, results in a lot of new donors being excited to support your organization. So we, we do anticipate, we want to anticipate at some level, the contributions of new donors. But typically that might be a 70-30 split between 70% existing donors and 30% new donors. Every campaign is gonna be a little bit different, but let's not entirely depend on new donors and let's not entirely depend on existing donors for our success. Um, what you really need to do as part of the planning is to build out a, a table of gifts. And if you don't know what a table of gifts is, this is probably not the right course to learn that. Um, the, the real quick summary is, is that a table of gifts tells you how many gifts at different levels are going to be required for you to succeed. And um, that table of gifts at a $10 million campaign, for example, might tell you that you need one gift at $2 million. And as a result, you might need three, four, five, six prospects just to secure that one gift of $2 million. That means you're going to make six, up to six asks if, if that's the ratio or three asks in the hopes of just getting one gift. So if you go down that table of gifts at all of these important levels from $2 million in the $10 million campaign example down to um, twenty five thousand dollars, let's say. You might need a you might need fifty gifts, and that might translate to two hundred prospective donors that need to be asked over the course of the campaign. So you need to find two hundred prospective donors. You need to annotate that table of gifts. You need to put a name of an individual, a corporation, a foundation, um, a, a service group, a religious congregation, whatever donor it might be, individual or organization, you need to annotate. You need to say, who are those $2 million prospects? Who are those $25,000 prospects? And, you know, it might be fluid. You know, some 
individual prospect or whatever kind of prospect might start at 25,000 and then be moved up to a hundred thousand dollars because you learn something over the course of time. But it's important that you know who your prospects are, that you spend time identifying prospective donors. And if you don't know, if you don't have a database that allows you to identify them, you're going to have to start really I, going through your own process of identification. And that means talking to your board members about who some prospective donors might be, talking to your major uh, donors themselves about who prospects might be, looking at other organizations in the community that do similar things to you and looking at those annual reports and finding out who those big donors are and looking at those um, donor walls for some of the bigger organizations in town and picking up who those foundations, corporations, individuals are that are giving at extraordinary levels. Um, those are all valid. And now with electronic tools that are available um, where you can search zip codes, where you can search um, giving databases, it becomes much more easy to um, fill out that prospect list and that table of gifts. Um, uh, though I would say the next step uh, post identification is really trying to identify linkages to your organization. Are they existing donors? Who do they know? Um, who's a point of contact or an access point to those people? So you got a lot of work there to do, but that is uh, foundational work that's often started during the planning phase of the campaign and continued over the entire course of the campaign. Um, and there have been campaigns where we knew we needed 200 donors and we only had 100 or 150 identified at the start of the campaign. But every day we tried to add new uh, prospective donors to that list and work on um, building a strategy for an approach to each single one of those 200 prospective donors. So we often say that um, every donor or prospective donor that you've identified is a campaign within a campaign. What does that mean? Every prospective donor on your list is going to have a strategy, is going to require a number of touches that lead to that ask and lead to that gift and lead to that stewardship. So be prepared for a lot of energy, effort, uh, and work to track and implement uh, steps appropriately when you start working uh, within a campaign. And that's often why uh, campaigns become uh, staff driven because there is often required staff, one or more individuals that are constantly monitoring and keeping uh, leaders accountable for the work that, uh, that those leaders are supposed to do and for the work that they themselves are supposed to do. Um, we want you to develop a campaign plan. I think I've mentioned a lot of different elements that are um, appropriate when thinking about a campaign plan. Um, I think about timelines. I think about uh, calendars. I think about um, tables of gifts. I think about org charts and roles and responsibilities. I think about the appropriate phasing of a campaign, what happens when, how much needs to be raised at certain times. I think about policies. I think about um, what recognition looks like, how you're going to recognize donors, uh, what um, methods you're going to use to cultivate individuals, what methods you're going to use to um, build out your PR mechanisms and communicate the campaign to the, the broader community. All of these things are tremendously important. And one of the things that comes to mind, which is important to mention now, in, in a campaign plan, you know, you're going to spend a certain amount of time of the campaign in the quiet phase, uh, and then a certain amount of time in the campaign in the public phase. And essentially, the quiet phase is before you've announced to the world that you are um, running a campaign and that you have a certain goal that's uh, an identified amount, and you're willing to share how much you've raised against that goal. So um, the work that you're doing uh, in the quiet phase is to educate and to 
invite every single member of your family, all your existing donors and everyone that's important to you to participate in that campaign um, and be in the proverbial tent before you go public so that no one feels left out, that all of your uh, most important people uh, have been invited and most of them have actually made a gift to the campaign. And at that point, when that's happened, you've usually raised half the money, three quarters of the money, or maybe even more. Usually we try to avoid going public with a um, uh, over and above campaign until the, you've reached 50% of the goal, total goal or more. Now those rules are different when you're looking at a comprehensive campaign that's definitely a 201 course on campaigns. We'll, um, we'll have to take up that topic later because ca uh, comprehensive campaigns have very different rules when it comes to public announcements for against their campaign goals. But in a standalone campaign, that $10 million example, you're not going to announce a campaign uh, with less than $5 million raised. You probably won't announce the campaign until you have seven or $8 million raised because you're spending so much time uh, inviting your family to join you in the tent. And that's the most important element there. And when you're in the quiet phase, you're not keeping from your family members how much you're trying to raise and what you've raised. You uh, accomplish that in your personal engagement and discussions with them. They're, they're part of the family. You want to tell them what's going on and where you are but you're not broadcasting that news uh, during the quiet phase to the broader community. You're not telling people in the newspaper that you have a $10 million goal and you've raised $2 million until you've brought all of your family members into the tent, okay? So that's an important part of a campaign plan to identify when that moment where you are going to go public should be in the campaign timeline and you work toward hitting those financial objectives and activity benchmarks from the start of the campaign until that point. Uh, again, a plan is only as good uh, as it is uh, followed and implemented. So um, all of these elements need to, to exist. Uh, leadership is incredibly important in campaigns. I know very few campaigns that don't succeed uh, when leadership isn't capable of um, doing the work uh, appropriately. And when I talk about leadership, I really am talking about internal leadership and external leadership. Um, internally, uh, we talk about the required leadership of the CEO um, and certain staff members, specifically in the development department, for example, that play a very important role in a campaign. The CEO oftentimes will be at the table in discussions, especially around an ask, with donors that are being asked to give at the most extraordinary levels, uh, you know, maybe $100,000 and above, maybe 50. It really depends on the size and scope of the campaign. It could be a million dollars and above. It really depends on the type of organization and, and the size of the goal. <clears throat> but often the CEO is expected to be involved, expected to be at the table. Doesn't always mean the CEO has to make the ask, but should be representing the organization in a very strong way and capable of expressing the vision of the organization, the opportunity that exists, and making the donor, prospective donor, feel extremely special. Um, the chief development officer might have a similar role, but often their role also is very um, operational as well, keeping the trains running on time. Um, and if the chief development officer is more of the relationship manager and, and the manager of the department, then you might find a campaign director or a major gift officer taking more of the operational leadership role of the campaign, making sure that those trains are running on time and everything is getting done that needs to get done. Again, um, leadership will help drive activity. They will help coordinate and they will often help train up and resource uh, and keep accountable other people uh, within the organization. Um, so that's the internal side of things. Externally, 
you find that volunteers are often an incredibly important resource for campaigns. And it's often unique uh, work in that campaigns, more than any other type of fundraising uh, activity, are most likely to engage volunteers in the fundraising work. Um, and, you know, there's really nothing wrong with a campaign that is principally led by a CEO and a development officer. Uh, I've seen that happen uh, many times. Um, but, you know, those campaign efforts are often more modest. Um, it's more common to uh, see a campaign that engages volunteers in some of the more significant responsibilities of fund development, like uh, in extending invitations, like um, making asks, like uh, speaking as an ambassador or advocate for uh, a campaign, hosting events, doing really uh, important work that creates additional bandwidth for the organization, uh, access for the organization, um, and allows the organization to perhaps have conversations or be involved in asks that it would otherwise not have that opportunity to do. Um, and in a campaign, most typical campaigns will have an organizational structure that has um, a chair or two at the top, campaign chairs, and it's great when those chairs give a lot of time, make a big gift, and engage deeply with the CEO or other people in the work of cultivating and soliciting prospective donors. That is beautiful. When that happens, it's, it's like a work of art. Um, and so that's what you should be really striving for, recruiting the very best, most engaged, most committed, most generous campaign chairs that you possibly can. Beyond that, there are often a few other volunteers that are recruited in, uh, in a small group. They might be the steering committee, the core group, maybe the board chair, maybe a few other board members, maybe a, a, a few other fundraising volunteers, the, the CEO. And together, you know, this core group, executive committee, whatever you call them, is probably making a lot of the core decisions and driving a lot of the ask activity uh, that exists for the campaign. Um, often campaigns don't have uh, an army of hundreds of people that are working on fundraising for the campaign where they're making asks. It, it's, it's often the case where it's a very small group, three, four, five, six people that are really driving every major ask of a campaign. And that's, that's fine. That's often how it, it happens. But the larger the campaign, uh, the bigger the organization, the more complex the volunteer structures are likely to be. So instead of only having six people on a campaign steering committee or a, a, a core group, you might have a larger group of made up of constituent chairs. And these constituent chairs might include, um, you know, a faculty chair, um, might include alumni uh, chairs. Um, other constituencies that your organization serves. And um, so maybe that campaign cabinet might end up being 25 people, um, chairs of these different constituent groups, plus the campaign steering committee members. Um, uh, and then remember, volunteers all need to be staffed by a staff member or a volunteer. There is an absolute need to, um, if you expect engagement on the part of volunteers, to have uh, capable individuals, either your campaign manager or another staff, be consistently working with and supporting the work of these volunteers. Um, and, it, and it's a lot to handle. It, uh, it, it does take a lot of bandwidth for staff to, to do this work, but um, it directly connects to revenue if it's done uh, appropriately. And then if you're a big organization, not only are you going to have constituent chairs, but you're going to have constituent committees, like your Grateful Patient Committee, like your faculty committee, like your physician committee, like your um, alumni 
uh, committee. And, and, and they're going to be populated with worker bees that are all um, really designed to be helpful through to help you through the fundraising process. So an incredibly important and valuable um, element. Um, external leadership includes the board. And there is an important role that the board plays in any campaign. Ideally, the board has committed 100% to um, supporting the campaign. And that means that there is some financial contribution. It doesn't have to be at a minimum level. Um, it can be um, at uh, whatever level is appropriate for that board member. But every board member should be able to give a uh, dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, some some gift. Uh, we recognize that not all board members are capable of giving extraordinary gifts. That's fine, but every board member needs to have some financial stake in the the campaign. It helps um, the messaging for the organization to be able to say, a hundred percent of our board is supporting this campaign effort financially with a gift, and that means it's time to seek the support of others outside of the, the core leadership group of the organization. But board members should also engage and commit to helping in other ways, um, thanking prospective donors or donors, um, inviting uh, prospective donors to attend an event, joining the CEO on a tour, uh, being an am ambassador and advocate, these are all incredibly important activities that you can see here on the screen and need to be pursued vigorously. Um, I talked about campaign phases, and we covered this really um, well, but generally speaking, campaigns are known for having very distinct phases. We talked about the foundational need of campaign planning. We talked about the need of... Um, having some period of time where you are recruiting your volunteers, uh, securing some of your more significant gifts, uh, approving all of the plans and policies and procedures. Um, and this might be some period of time, like six months or something into the campaign, all while the campaign is still in the quiet phase. And still while in the quiet phase, you're starting to really focus on uh, securing lead gifts, the biggest gifts of the campaign, while you're also then preparing for the next phases of the campaign. And at some point, you start to say, now, you know, all of our faithful donors and friends are in the tent. Let's make that public announcement. And you have your public campaign and you're trying to put the cherry on top of the campaign, maybe going from $8 million to $10 million plus. Uh, in that $10 million campaign example. And that $2 million is going to come from some sort of uh, more community-focused efforts, trying to get anyone and everyone to make a gift at some size. So a lot of kind of crowdfunding type initiatives might be launched. Uh, you might then go back to some of your early donors with um, uh, another ask if, if that's appropriate or required. But then you uh, celebrate your success. You get to that point where you've gone over goal, you've closed out the campaign, and now it's time to uh, throw a party and uh, thank everyone for the first time uh, for uh, their work and their effort and thanking donors, recognizing donors. And then over the course of the next several years, while um, pledges are being paid, you will be thanking donors and stewarding them um, vigorously. Uh, and that's completely and totally important for the success of the campaign. Um, and I brought up a good point there that I wouldn't want to miss, uh, which is this, that um, a distinction of many campaigns is that they're not all cash gifts. The vast majority of gifts to a campaign effort are pledged commitments, meaning they're gifts payable over time over a three to five year period normally, maybe sometimes less, maybe sometimes more time. But um, the the annual gift is often a cash gift that's made during the, the, the fiscal year. Um, a commitment or a campaign gift is often made by documenting a pledge of paying a certain amount over time. 
And let's say it's $100,000 and that gift might be paid $20,000 a year for the next five years. And that's very common. So um, because of that, when you're thinking about construction projects, you're thinking about other th needs, um, you're not, not often collecting all of the money in the campaign in, in the first year. You're collecting it over time. So you need to be prepared for cash flow and how that impacts the expenditures of the organization. So if you're building a building, you might need to borrow some money uh, on an interim basis to get the project completed while pledges are being paid. So cash management becomes an incredibly important need of organizations to look at during uh, capital campaigns as well. Um, another important thing is budget. And we haven't talked about this yet, but it is a part of the campaign plan. It is a part of the campaign discussion. And the message really is this, investment precedes return. You need to invest in the uh, enterprise of a campaign for it to succeed. It's no different than anything else. If you don't have the money required to pay staff, to pay for collateral development, marketing PR, events, postage, office space, um, recognition, whatever the, the, the things are that go into your budget, um, you're less likely to succeed. And you can certainly raise money on the cheap um, and you can certainly overspend on a campaign, um, but it's really appropriate and important to understand that often campaigns will, um, at the end of the campaign, probably have... Um, spent six to eight cents on the dollar raised in expenses. So what does that mean? That means that um, eight cents of every dollar that you raise will often go to pay for staff, to pay for event costs and those other things that you see here, um, which is still an extraordinarily um, successful ROI. Uh, the, the margin on that is incredible. The investment is very low. It's the most effective and efficient way to to fundraise, but you don't want to caught, un, be caught under investing in this, this effort. And if it costs 10 cents on the dollar, 12 cents on the dollar, it is what it is. Um, there's probably value and, and need to do that, but you got to figure out that budget and you need to be prepared to invest upfront in that campaign. And often there is a need to front load some of the um, investment in this campaign on staffing, on materials, on events, other things, before you actually see the money come back into the organization. Um, and so one thing that a board will need to grapple with is um, the ability that it has to uh, loan the campaign a certain amount of money until pledge payments start coming in. And it might be $100,000, $150,000 or more or less um, for the first six months until certain gifts come in to repay some of that initial investment. And that's totally uh, acceptable and common practice to loan a campaign money and to have that money be repaid to the organization. So if it takes it out of reserves, it takes it out of endowment, um, that's very common to do, but you should get paid. And expenses are meant to be paid out of the gifts that you receive to the campaign. So there's a, uh, sort of a, a pie that's developed and um, there's a, a piece of the pie that might go to a capital project, a piece of the pie that might go to program, a piece of the pie that might go to endowment, and then a small sliver uh, of a piece that would go to expenses. Um, and, you know, usually we don't say fundraising costs. We usually um, say something like marketing and fundraising costs or something that, uh, some term that allows people to understand that uh, this is an essential investment uh, necessary for the campaign to succeed. So, you know, it, it's incredibly important to um, be thoughtful about that budget. And it is true that uh, investment precedes return. So um, I've gone way over time. I apologize. Um, I know that there are still some folks on the line and would love to open it up to uh, any sort of discussion if you're open to it. If you have questions that you have, uh, I'd love to hear them now. So take yourself off mute and, and ask away.
All right, we've got a quiet group today, which is no problem whatsoever. Um, I'm certainly grateful for everyone's participation today. As I mentioned earlier, um, you might want to um, ask additional questions at some point in the future. If, if there are questions, please use um, the contact uh, email here to reach me. I will be quick to respond and uh, look forward to fielding your questions and uh, chatting with you about uh, your plans and, and how you might uh, be successful in campaign fundraising. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, good luck, everyone, with your fundraising. And do reach out if there's anything I can do to be helpful. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much.